Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I'm John Lomaking. Thank you for joining us. And most of you join us almost every week. And as we travel, we come to find out that this is a very loved program of 3ABN as we combine five different viewpoints and five different voices every lesson study to, communi to communicate something very, very viable. And managing for the master till he comes has been our focus. And we continue in lesson number 10 entitled Giving Back. Before we go any further, to my left, we have Danny Shelton. How are you doing, Danny? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> okay. Not the basketball court. This is no, different. No, no, no. I'm just out of school. We're ready. Okay. Shelly Quinn. How are you doing, Shelly? The lady with many well, hats. I have Tuesday's lesson, Begin with Personal Needs. Okay. And John Denzi, what do you have today for us? Uh, I have Wednesday, an interesting title, Deathbed Charity. Mm. Deathbed mm. Charity. Wow. All the way down, Jill, how are you doing there today? Doing well, Pastor John. I have spiritual legacy. Spiritual legacy. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's something, uh, that's why giving back is such a significant title. So let's go ahead and begin with prayer today. Danny, would you start with, for us? Sure. Lord, again, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for life, health, and strength. We thank you as always for the opportunity of being able to come before you. Mm -hmm. We thank you for this media that literally is reaching the world. So we pray again that everything that's said and done will be done to your honor and to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. You know, the lesson points out something that young people don't think about, legacy. What do I do with all this stuff that I've amassed over the years? How big is my garage and how big is my shed and what do I do with all that stuff that's losing meaning as I get older and older? That's why it's entitled Giving Back. You know, as we... As we age, life is kind of like a mountaintop experience. You climb up, you get to that apex where life looks so beautiful, then you realize you got to climb down the other side and go back to the valley. Then all of a sudden, perspective begins to be the focal point of your life. What do I do with all the stuff I dragged up the mountain? Now that I'm down the other side, do I really need it? And um, this week's lesson focuses on, as he says, God's counsel regarding our last years. And I like the question, what are the things that we should do? What should we avoid doing? And what principles should we follow? So that's what we're going to talk about this week. Our memory verse is Revelation 14, verse 13. And the Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I heard a saying many years ago, what we do for, what we do for self will pass, mm -hmm. what we do for Christ will last. Will last. Mm -hmm. And that's what this lesson is talking about, uh, the legacy that we leave behind. How do you want to be remembered? <clears throat> do, you want to be, do you want to be remembered as a person that just pulled everything to yourself or the person who allowed your life to be a con conduit, a blessing, yeah. reaching into hearts and lives of other people on various levels. That's why Sunday's lesson is so significant. Let's turn to Luke chapter 12, and we're going to look together at a title the Bible gives it, calls it The Rich Fool. <laughs> you know, when, if we call somebody a fool, the Bible says we're in danger of hell fire. <laughs> but when the Lord calls you a fool there must be something about divinity that sees far deeper than humanity does. Let's consider the story in verses 16 to 21. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, by the way, a parable is something that applies at a broad spiritual principle that applies to everyone, but there are characters often mentioned in the parable that really don't exist, but the circumstances and scenarios are true to life in every generation. It says, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I'll do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. Ugh. Some of us have sheds bigger than our houses. <laughs> Not mentioning me, but I'm one of those. <clears throat> and I will say to my soul, verse 19, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. You can see him on the front porch in his recliner, a nice warm day, 
uh, some lemonade and maybe a little maybe a little umbrella in it with a <laughs> with a cherry on top <laughs> and thinking looking at his beautifully manicured lawn saying been a long time before I got to this point in life and I'm just going to enjoy it. <laughs> but the story continues. <laughs> but God said to him, hmm, fool, fool, yeah. this mm. night your soul will be required of you. Mm, mm, mm. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? Mm -hmm. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Wow, there are a number of questions that come to the forefront, three of those which we'll answer in detail. One is, what's the relevant message to us? Secondly, what strong rebuke did the Lord give to the foolish man? And finally, what should that say to us regarding our attitude toward what we own? There's a quotation here from the lesson that I want to bring to you, and I, I alluded to this, but it fits in better here. As we near the end of our earning years, our financial focus turns toward preserving our assets in anticipation of the end of life. The transition from working to retirement can be a very traumatic experience. In terms of our finances, what is the best way to proceed? Mm -hmm. Especially when the stock market starts taking a nosedive mm -hmm. and you think, no, no, down nine points, down 200, down 600 points. Mm. Oh, the downturn, the interest rate is going up. Well, the Fed's going to make another increase in the interest rate. And you wonder, no, I won't have anything left for retirement. I've known people that have lost thousands on the stock market because mm. one, that happened to them and they got nervous and pulled all their money out mm. and tried to put it back in when the stock market started to rise and they did not get the same benefits. So one of the things we find out here that I think is being recommended is don't live financially, and I'm going to use the word right here, don't allow your financial life to become a trauma to you. Mm. In other words, don't act out of impulse. Mm. Be a person that is trusting in the Lord, uh, giving to God what belongs to him. Because it goes on to say, as, as uh, Ed Reed brought out, as people get older, they almost naturally begin to worry about the future. Mm. The most common fears are, here are some of them, dying too soon before the family is taken care of, mm -hmm. living too long, outliving their assets or savings, catastrophic illness, all my resources could go at one time, and mental and or physical disabilities, who will take care of me? And those are real legitimate questions because, you know, I heard a story, my sister talked about a, a police officer that... Um, he was dating for a number of years and he finally got married and two years later had a traumatic motorcycle accident and now he's mm. can't walk any longer oh. and he's very, very severely damaged. Just finally got his life together and then trauma comes along. And as um, uh, one of our church members said, we all are going to die one of three ways, either by old age, by illness or by accident. There's no fourth category. Mm. Isn't that terrible? Old age, boy, if I want to go, I want to go peacefully. But we don't have those choices. That's in the hand of the Lord. In the book, Christ Object Lessons, we are told, this man's aims were no higher than those of the beast that perish. He lived as if there were no God, no heaven, no future life, as if everything he possessed was his own. And he owned nothing. And he owed nothing to God or to man. So three points I want to bring out and then wrap it in some, uh, uh, I would say, uh, ecclesiastical uh, gift wrapping, because this story is one that could be an entire sermon for me. But um, if during the stage of life, we think only of ourselves and ignore the needs of others and the cause of God, we are following the example of the rich fool. Mm. That's one of the examples brought out. He thought only of himself, not his neighbors, as the Lord said to the rich young ruler, give everything you have to your neighbors and then follow me. Mm. There was no indication in Jesus's parable that the rich man was lazy or dishonest. So it doesn't mean you have to be dishonest or lazy, it just simply means your focus is all about self. Mm -hmm. What do I get? <clears throat> How am I gonna be impacted? So three things I wanna to bring to the forefront and then just give you a closing thought from the lesson. One, be mindful of materialistic accountability. 
1 Timothy 6 and verse 17. It says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. <clears throat> you know, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it talks about the cycle of life. Mm -hmm. And we all get to the point where, you know, the days come that we say we have no pleasure in them. I've seen people that are just existing. Uh, you know, I've gone to care facilities and nursing homes and you see people that are there mm -hmm. and you think, wow, is that where I'm headed? Mm -hmm. what, what happens if I get to that point in life? Who's going to take care of me? I was in Singapore and there was a lady in the, a care facility. There was nothing wrong with her at all. I said, why are you here? She said, well, I have three sons. They're really busy in their life. I said, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with you. But she said, because they're too busy to take care of me, so I'm here. Mm. And she was functioning fine, walking around, not even with a cane or not even with a walker. And I thought, wow, what happens when you get to a certain point in life when your <clears throat> value seems to diminish in the eyes of those that you've given life to? How sad that does happen to some people. The, th the second thing that this story brings out to me is wealth is not an assurance of salvation. Matthew 19:24. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You'll study the Bible and you'll never see that God is upset with people with wealth. That's not what the scripture teaches because many of the servants of God were wealthy men. Hey, vis-a-vis -vis Job, Abraham, Solomon, to say the least, these men were men that were blessed financially tremendously. Lydia, the seller of purple, Nicodemus, these people had wealth. There's nothing wrong with wealth and possessions. But I think I may have said this in a prior lesson. When we allow our possessions to possess us, that's where the problem comes in. That's right. Which is the third point. The gospel brings riches into sharper focus. The gospel, when you hear about the gospel that cannot be purchased, Salvation is a gift, not of works, not of financial gain, lest anyone should boast. So the wealthy and the poor have to go through the same channels through the grace and righteousness of Jesus. James 2 and verse 5 brings us into focus. Listen, my beloved brethren, God has not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and ears of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? So when you look at the life of the rich fool, remember this. If you are at that stage in life where time is more behind you than ahead of you, think these words, legacy. How will I be remembered? Whose life will be benefited from the things that God entrusted to me? Mm -hmm. And don't be like the rich fool that says, I've got all the time in the world because time is only in the hand of God. Be a wise person and God will bless you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I have Monday's lesson. I'm Danny Shelton. And uh, I love it. It says, you can't take it with us. My mm -hmm. dad used to say, you can't take it with you, but uh, we can't take it with you. It's a pretty cut and dried lesson in a nutshell. It's just reminding us that we are stewards of the finances that God gives us while we're here on this earth. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the spiritual concept of, of as Christians, but as Christians, we also want to look at what happens with what we have uh, after we pass away, after we die. So we're also reminded that uh, life is very short. In fact, uh, Job 14 says, man that is born a woman, is few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut low and fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not till the heavens be no more. Wow. I mean, that's kind of the story of man. <laughs> Just Job knew how to put it right there. I mean, that, that's amazing. Now, the only way we can escape death, you talked about pastor ways that we were going to die. The only way we can escape it is if we happen to be alive when Jesus comes back. Now, that would be all of our wish and all of our hope and prayer. But you know what? Going to sleep is not the worst thing that can happen to us because as soon as we wake up, the very first thing we see will be the what? The face of Jesus. Amen. So now I'll admit, Shelley, when you gave me this title that I really, I really liked it. It became kind of personal to me because the, you can't take it with you is one of my my dad, my dad had all these things. I mean, he had so many things, but this is one of them. This is one of them. He'd say, you can't take it with you. So if somebody had something, you might as well do something with it. Plan on it now, because when you die, uh, you can't take it with you. You're going to the grave without it. So 
that really hit me because it brought me back to thinking about my dad. But as you know, there are people in life who scrimp and save their whole life only to die and someone else ends up with all their money, right? Mm -hmm. Some people will do without almost everything in life. They don't want to uh, spend one red cent, my mom used to say, but they won't, won't want to <laughs> spend one penny on something even if they really need it. Mm -hmm. So I'm also sure that you've heard about people that die and people going afterwards and they'll find hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. in shoe boxes and closets mm -hmm. in the attic tucked away somewhere. I know personally of someone who had money under the bathtub that had gotten wet and so the bank referred to it as stinky money. So, <laughs> but these same people, if you look at their house, they're, some of them were uh, dilapidated. We, you would look at, the neighbors would look at them and say, the people look malnourished. Um, they dro drove an old car. What are they doing with hundreds of thousands of dollars? The, the neighbors considered them pul pulpers. But oftentimes these people had no relatives, no will. So that's when the state takes over. And I'm sure as Christians, that's not what we want to happen, right? We want to know what happens to our asset. Another good reason for estate planning is that I can tell you from experience, the closest of families can become the biggest enemies when someone dies and there's not a will, there's not something in place because you would never dream this could happen. You say, oh, don't worry, it won't happen to our family. Well, we hope not, but we've seen it. Jill, you can attest to that many, many times, even because we have a, a wills and trust department, which I'll talk about in, in just a little bit. As Christians, we want to make sure that a portion of our assets are left for the Lord's work. Just like now we pay tithe and we pay offerings while we're alive. So we should also plan to take care of the Lord's work even after we're dead. So sometimes we don't like to think about it. So I remember when my dad was talking to people and he thought they might have a little money, he would say, you need to plan with what you're going to do with it now because you can't take it with you. Exactly. He'd say, you can't take it with you. So go ahead now. And uh, so he'd say, when it's all said and done, you can't take it to the grave. Well, Psalms 49, 17 says, for when he dieth, he shall carry nothing mm. away. How much will he carry away? Mm. When he dieth, he shall carry nothing nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Mm -hmm. So there's an old song that says, no matter how high in society they go or how much money they save, but when they close their eyes in death, they can only fill one grave. Ooh. Not F-E-E-L, but F-I-L-L, -L, right? It's a great thought actually, because when rich or poor, when we die, if you think about it, it's the same size coffin in the same size hole in the ground to bury them, right? right. Nobody knows at that point whether you're, you're rich or poor because it takes the same, same amount. But even as you look at some of these giant pyramids built for the kings back in the Bible times, the table that they laid the king on is still the same size as the pauper's hole that they dug for him outside. So mm -hmm. hopefully you're following with us here. So I guess our Sabbath school <laughs> lesson is just preparing us for the fact that while we're preparing spiritually for heaven, we also should be preparing for what happens to our assets after our death. Yes. There's an old tombstone with an inscription. That's in case, because some of you, you've probably heard this and others say, well, I don't know, if, John, we've talked about dying. The Bible talks about dying, but this really brought it home to me. And I've heard this several years ago and it came to my mind. The old inscription says, dear friends, Please know as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. Mm. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare yourself to follow me. <laughs> so, so 1 Timothy 6, uh, uh, 6, 6 and 7 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. That's right. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. <clears throat> This brings me once again back to my dad because he worked hard at giving his kids many life lessons that we really didn't want to know and until many years later. But then when we were ready to think about him, sadly, he was already gone. But one of his statements was, and I'll, I'll say the way he quoted it, you didn't bring nothing into this world and you certainly ain't going to take nothing out. 
So for years, I actually didn't know that that wasn't, that, that was, wasn't a, I didn't know it was a Bible scripture. He was paraphrasing because I heard him say it so much. I just thought my dad came up with that. You ain't going to take nothing out, he would say. Then he would continue. When you're lowered into the grave, the only real thing people will remember you by is your character mm -hmm. for good or bad. So guard it closely. Yeah. And it makes so much sense. So far, in this little lesson, we've learned that barring the second coming of Christ, right, in our lifetime, we're all going to die. John, you said one way or the other. You gave us, yeah, yeah. You gave us the choices of, of, and it's not choices, but the particular ways that it could happen. So the question for all of us is this. If we don't take anything out when we leave this world, what happens to our assets when we die, yeah. right? I'm going to say it again. If we don't take anything out of this world, as the Bible says, we don't take it out. What's going to happen to what we have? Now, it could be small or it could be large. It doesn't make any difference. It's that we are stewards of what God has given us. And so how are we preparing? And I think they've done a good job because when you first read the Sabbath school lesson, sometimes you say, uh, now, where, where are they going? But in this case, I don't think enough about it. And I think a lot of you don't either. And maybe that's because we don't like to think about death, right? So in most cases, what will happen is we either have a will, an executor who will distribute your estate when you pass on, or you're going to have, as we mentioned earlier, you're going to have family and everybody else probably fighting over it. I hate to say that. But 3ABN has a planning department that's been helping people for over 25 years, Jill. Right. And I remember Leonard Westfall because people would say, I don't know about giving to 3ABN. What if they need money? The Lord may take me, you know, take me to death, to my rest. And Leonard would always say to them, I promise you that when you leave your portion and your estate to 3ABN, you will not die one day sooner. Hmm. Then he would add, in fact, I can almost guarantee you'll live longer. Why? Because you have peace of mind. <laughs> so you know what? I can tell you that many, many people actually tell us that, you know, since I signed this over, I have great peace of mind. Yeah. And I remember one lady who gave a large, a huge amount in cash. And when she gave it to us, she said, I've never been so glad to get rid of anything in my life because the responsibility was so bad. So in essence, estate planning is very important for each of us to make sure that whatever assets that we have that God has blessed us with on this earth that will be used for his honor and for his glory. What we do leave behind is our influence that we have on our loved ones and family members and even people that we didn't even know. That's what's important because as John said, Lanny Wolf wrote a song that's only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Danny. Amen. Amen. Wow, that's you know that, that saying about the funeral uh, effigy on the on the coffin is the latter part of that it says to follow you I'm not content until I know just where you went <laughs> so when you, as you think about that we're going to take a short break and be right back for the continuation of our lesson don't go away ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We go to Shelley Quinn on Tuesday. Begin with personal needs. Yes, it's interesting. Giving back, begin with personal needs. I'm going to make a confession. There's one scripture passage that this is focusing on. That's Proverbs 27, 23 to 27. We'll get to those four verses. And I looked and I read them and I thought, I don't even remember reading these before. That's not something I have focused on in Proverbs. So it was interesting. Where I want to begin is what does he mean giving back, begin with personal needs? 1 Timothy 5.8. 1 Timothy 5.8 says this. If anyone fails to provide for his relatives and especially for those of his own family, he has disowned the faith. Mm. by failing to accompany it with fruits is basically what he's saying. 
and is worse than an unbeliever who does take care of these matters. One, one translation says you're worse than an infidel. Mm -hmm. The Bible warns against being greedy. It warns against the rich trampling the poor, mm -hmm. but it never condemns the efforts to acquire wealth honestly. And, right. and there is, there's much to be said about wise financial management. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with all your possessions, mm -hmm. with the first fruits of all your increase, so your barns will be filled with plenty. Have you got a barn? Mm -hmm. what, what is he saying here? You know, God's promised blessings in the Old Testament are couched in agricultural language because most of the nation of Israel were farmers or shepherds. So how does that promise translate to us today that if we honor the Lord with our wealth, that our barns will be filled? Basically saying, if you're financially faithful to God, He is going to bless your work. He's going to bless your business mm -hmm. as long as you're willing to follow and obey Him. So now let's get to this wonderful passage that I've never studied before. Proverbs 27, 23 through 27. Basically what I figured out is this is contrasting our labor with God's provisions. Mm -hmm. And it's showing us that we need to manage diligently the blessings that God has given us. So let's look at it. Proverbs 27, 23, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and look well to your herd, your herds. So what God is telling us here through Solomon is that there is wisdom in our financial planning in knowing our financial affairs. Uh, what G. Edward Reed suggests is that we review our financial records and our balance sheets. We need to use our resources wisely. It goes on in the next verse, verse 24, Proverbs 27, 24. For riches are not forever. Does a crown endure to all generations? Basically, what he's saying here, riches, power are uncertain. They're fleeting. Somebody can be in power today and, and be at the bottom of the food chain <laughs> the next day. But Solomon is actually talking to his son here. So I see that there's, there's a great message for spiritual leaders, pastors, elders, people who are at the head of of uh, ministries, as a good steward, you need to manage the resources of your human mm -hmm. and material blessings. God blesses 3ABN with mm -hmm. beautiful people, does he not? We've yeah. got some of the most precious Absolutely. people here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say, you all are very gracious to all of us, so you do manage the resources that God has given you well. And I know that we can, we, we definitely stretch our financial resources here. But there's a message to the pastors here. First Peter 5, 2 and 3 says this, Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, hmm. not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. It's interesting also when it says riches are not forever, that word can also be translated as strength. And boy, do we know that. A man is basically, that would be saying, and, and the Septuagint translate, it translates it in this manner for riches are not forever. It says, a man has not strength and power forever. Mm -hmm. What is God saying to us? Mm -hmm. Be diligent about the blessings that I've given you. Plan for the future. We need to plan for our retirement. And I'm gonna tell you, mm -hmm. the younger you are when you start planning for retirement, 
you can sock away just a little tidy little sum of money each each year or each month and it is going to because of compound interest by the time you reach 65 retirement you're going to have so much more than if you try to get everything going and paying along the way and wait till you're old as we had to because of our debt but it's it's good to plan for your retirement before your strength is gone because you don't know where you're going to end up. Mm -hmm. Verse 27, Proverbs 27, 25, excuse me, Proverbs 27, 25. This is interesting. When the hay is gone, the tender grass shows itself and herbs of the mountains are gathered in. Basically, if you're a farmer, well, I know that we used to harvest the hay and pretty soon the new grass would appear for grazing. Later, we'd harvest the grain and we used the grain and the hay to provide for the livestock. Verse 26, the lambs will be for your clothing. The goats will furnish you the price of a field. And then verse 27, there will be goats milk enough for your food, for the food of your household and for the maintenance of your maids. Well, that doesn't mean a whole lot to people nowadays <laughs> because we don't have goats. But what he's basically that the lambs provided wool. They got, they got their shelter, they got their food, they got their clothing from their herds. So they took really good care of their herds. And often they would keep the females for breeding and they'd sell, sell the males so that they could reinvest mm -hmm. and that money either by buying the field or buying more. So basically the bottom line is this proverb is telling us to be responsible stewards. We need to care for our families. That is something that God takes very seriously. We need to care for our home and our career and plan for our financial future. It's always uncertain. You've got to have an emergency fund. If you don't hear anything else I'm saying now, you should have three to four months of whatever your monthly income is put away in savings, not your long-term savings, but your short-term. Keep it where it's available to you in case of an emergency, should you lose your job or have some kind of emergency. Plan for retirement. Hard work plus God's provisions results in having resources for the needs of life. And there's just a whole lot of peace when you've got uh, when you don't have financial stress. But now let me just bring it down to kind of tie this in. If you're 18 or above, you should have a will. You're going to ask me why I'm saying this. Had a friend divorced, daughter 18 moved out. Two months later, was hit by a truck. Mm -hmm. The insurance paid a huge sum for this death. It killed her. And all of a sudden, her daughter was 18 and of age, not living at home, didn't have a will. And all those insurance proceeds became, uh, it was between the state and the father that she wasn't close to. You might think, well, I don't need something that young. If you're married and have a child, you definitely, if you don't have a will, sit down tonight and write one out. You've got to have a will in place. And then through your earning years, what you need to do, we used to do this regularly. Now I think we do it about every three years, but every year, the first of the year, I used to review everything and see, okay, is all my insurance coverage up to date? Is there anything about our will that needs to change? And, you know, we changed our will and uh, we've actually, I advise you tell you, we've told our relatives, you can have certain pieces of ours, but as far as the money is concerned, we're leaving them a little portion and all of the rest is going to 3ABN to continue the Lord's work because that's what we want to do with our life. Praise the Lord. Well, my name is John Dinsey, and we are now moving to Wednesday's portion of the lesson, a title, I had never considered this before, Deathbed Charity. What does that mean? This is talking about people that apparently do not use their finances while they are living. They see opportunities. Uh, they hear about different projects, building a church, evangelistic campaigns, missionaries that need help, but they hold on to their money, and they basically uh, wait 
write a will and say, I left my money for this, I left my money for that. And it's very interesting because some principles are brought out in this day's lesson that will help us understand that that is not the wisest way to go. Let's move to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, the first scripture presented in this uh, lesson uh, for this day. I'm going to read the first part and then we're going to go to another scripture. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches. We will stop there for a moment and consider the uh, Greek word used here, which is hopsilofreneo, which means to be high-minded, high proud, and arrogant. That's the word that was uh, presented as haughty in the New King James Version. And so in the King James Version, it uses the word high-minded. And here, this scripture tells us that's not the way to live. That's not the way to behave if you are better off than someone else. Do not consider others lower than yourself. And it also says, do, nor to trust in uncertain riches. You have already heard the reality that you could be rich one moment and poor the next. This is the reality of the present age that we live in, especially if you have your money invested in those things that go up and down all the time. And so if you're going to invest, you have to invest in something that you know is more secure. Now it's... Uh, it's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 to 21 that I see a, a balance concerning riches. It says, in beginning in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. Do we live in an age where uh, moth and rust can destroy and thieves can break in and steal? Absolutely. But notice verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, or where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, this is not talking that there's a way to send your money to heaven. This is talking about using the money for the Lord's cause to be a blessing to yourself and to your family. Yes, you have heard wise counsel. You have to plan for retirement. You have to plan to take care of your family. You also have to plan for the education of your children. But there has to be a balance in how money is used because the cause of God has needs. And we do not know how much time we have. For the Lord uh, is coming soon. And we see signs indicating that the Lord is coming soon. So we have to uh, be in communion with the Lord. So when the Lord prompts us to let us know, it's time for you to use this money for the Lord's, Lord's cause. We will be ready to give that money for that use. And so let's move to 2 Corinthians. Uh, actually, I need to go to the last part of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Let's read the first part again. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. That's who we are supposed to trust. Not the riches, but in the living God. And He blesses us to be able to enjoy the things He gives us, but also to be a blessing to others. Let's find the balance by the grace of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Now we go there. It says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Again, find the balance. The things that we see on earth, you know, uh, some people seem to have the idea that we need to gather as, you know, I think I've even heard there's a saying, I don't know quite, quite how it goes, maybe Pastor Lumber can remember this, gather as, uh, the job you have on this world is gather as much as you can or as, much, as many toys as you can and then you will die. This is the idea that some people seem to have. But we are not to trust in uncertain riches. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 8 says, Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Notice the balance that he was looking for here. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Now, why is he saying this? I like to move you to verse 9. Proverbs 30, verse 9. Lest I be full, that's full of uh, having plenty, and deny you. There's a danger in riches that you have so much that you forget about the Lord. This is why 
uh, whether poor or rich, we need to search uh, for the Lord with all of our heart, take up our cross daily and follow Jesus, we will find the balance. And let's read that again. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. Two extremes are presented here and we need to ask for the balance. Uh, you know, uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, we have these wonderful words. He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. This is the wise words of King Solomon. Now, uh, I'm going to share this story that I have shared before for the benefit of those who have not heard it. Uh, there was, uh, in the country of Brazil, we have a uh, evangelist, uh, Alejandro Bujon, and he has a television program at that time, and he was, uh, uh, received a message from a very wealthy man, and he invited him to dinner, and he says, come to this restaurant at this particular time, I want you to have dinner with me. Hmm. And he sent him a message. Uh, and he, Pastor uh, Bujong, uh, they told him, oh, you need to go. This is a very wealthy man. Who knows? This may be a great opportunity uh, for you to share the gospel with him. But when he arrived at this dinner, the rich man looked at him and said, I've been watching your program and you have something that I do not have. And I want to know how you got it, where you got it, and how I can have it. But I don't want you to talk to me about Jesus Christ. And Pastor Bujong was surprised because if he wanted what he had, then he needed to understand how he got it. And Pastor Bujon said, look, I can talk to you about the stocks and bonds and uh, all these type of things, but, and I can also talk to you about soccer and uh, sports, but really, what is that gonna do for you? You can talk to others about that. I can talk to you about soccer because I watch soccer games, but this is not gonna bring you the peace that you need. Your money cannot buy this peace. You can only find this peace in Jesus Christ. And he shared, he says, if you are willing to, to have what I have, then you need to know the Savior that I know, and that is Jesus Christ. And this is the reality of things. Money will not satisfy you. The rich, all the riches in the world will not bring you satisfaction, peace, and happiness. It is Jesus Christ. And this is where the lesson brings out the idea of deathbed uh, charity. I read to you uh, from a quote found in, in the lesson. It says, I saw that many withhold from the cause while they live, quieting their consciences that they will be charitable at death. They hardly dare exercise faith and trust in God to give anything while living. But this deathbed Charity is not what Christ requires of his followers. It cannot excuse the selfishness of living. Those who hold fast their property till the last moment to surrender it at death rather than to the cause. Losses are occurring continually. Banks fail and property is consumed in very many ways. Many purpose to do something, but they delay the matter and Satan works to prevent the means from coming into the treasury at all. It is lost before it is returned to God and Satan exalts that it is so. This is from Testimonies uh, for the Church, volume five, page 154. So uh, the reality is that opportunities are being presented to us daily to do something to advance the gospel. Consider. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. You have an opportunity to help spread the gospel so the end can come. And the truth of the matter is Luke chapter 6, verse 38. We cannot outgive the Lord. Notice, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you again. So consider these things and give to the Lord as the Lord indicates to you and you will be blessed and happy. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Johnny, each one of you. What a great lesson. What a practical lesson with things that we each need to look at and consider. My name is Jill Morricone. On Thursday, we look at spiritual legacy. Before we look at that, I have a question for you. What are the effects of sin? The common answers would be what? Sickness, suffering, pain, Disease, decay, and death, these are the effects of sin, is it not? Manipulation, lying, cowardice, killing. What about from a financial perspective? What are the effects of sin? It's poverty, not having enough to live on. It's greed, wanting more than you need and not being content with what you have. It's covetousness, wanting more than you have have, wanting what's not yours. It's hoarding, keeping more than you need, or stealing, taking what is not yours. Oppression, pushing others down to take from them so you can enrich yourself. What about pride? Wanting, taking, coveting what is not yours. What is our legacy? We don't want a legacy of greed like Gehazi. Elisha's servant, he ended up with leprosy. We don't want a legacy of covetousness like Achan. He ended up dead along with his family. We don't want a legacy of hoarding like the rich fool that Pastor John talked about. He ended up dead. We don't want a legacy of stealing like Jacob who stole the birthright from his brother and he had to run for his life. We don't want a legacy of oppression like Joseph's brothers who sold him into slavery. We don't want the legacy of pride like Lucifer who was cast out from heaven. What is our legacy? Legacy is something that's passed on, is it not? From one generation to another. It's someone's faith, maybe their ethics their core values. It could be someone's assets passed on from generation to generation. One's character, that is a legacy as well. What about spiritual legacy? Because that's what the focus of this lesson is on. What is our spiritual legacy? Now you might be saying, but I don't have kids and grandkids. If you have kids and grandkids, they are definitely, you can pass along a spiritual legacy to them. But if you don't, you can pass on a spiritual legacy to those within the sphere of your influence. It can be coworkers, it can be neighbors, it can be people in the church. We all have an influence on someone else and we can pass that spiritual legacy on. So I want to give you seven ways that you can leave a spiritual legacy. And this would be any age. We don't have to be 80 years old or 100 years old to leave a spiritual legacy. You can be passing on a spiritual legacy even while you're alive. So the first way, I call it the legacy of stewardship. Recognize that God created, God owns, and God sustains everything. He owns the earth, does he not? And the world, Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalm 50, 10 tells us that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and every beast of the forest belongs to him. He created and sustains everything. We've been studying this all quarter on stewardship. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, this is Jesus Christ, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. You see, God created us, we did not evolve. God owns this earth and everything in it. We don't own any money, we don't control money, we don't own a job, we don't own a spouse, we don't own possessions, everything belongs to God and we are merely stewards of what he's entrusted to us. So the first legacy is a legacy of stewardship. Teach your children and grandchildren, teach those under the sphere of your influence that what they have and what they possess is not theirs. It's merely given to them by God to be stewards over. Number two, way to create a spiritual legacy. 
spend time in the Word of God. This is what I call the legacy of knowledge. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. My grandma left me a legacy of knowledge. I can remember as a little girl, her getting up in the morning, opening up her Bible. She was dyslexic. She had a hard time reading. And yet she would stumble over those passages. She would read because she wanted to instill in her the Word of God. And that legacy was passed on to me, that legacy of knowledge of the Word of God. And you can pass that on to those within your influence. Number three. This is what I call the legacy of love. Love God and love other people. Some people pass on the legacy of knowledge, but they're mean about it and they're harsh about it. You can love your children. You can love your grandkids. You can love those within the sphere of your influence and teach them to love God and love others. Mark 12, 30 and 31. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus has taught us this, and this is what a wonderful legacy that we can live and that we can teach is the legacy of love. Number four, this is what I call the legacy of faithfulness. Serve God faithfully. Instruct those within the sphere of your influence to faithfulness. Luke 16, 10, he who is faithful and that which is least is faithful also in much, but he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Many times we think the big things matter. Well, I'll, I'll follow God and I'll pay attention to that when I'm called to some great position or I'm, I'm blessed with a great deal of money. The little things matter just as much. Faithfulness matters. The words we speak, the duties we do, or the duties left undone. Following through on your word, faithfulness matters. Leave a legacy of faithfulness. Number five is what I call the legacy of prayer. Pray consistently over your family, over your kids and grandkids, over those within the sphere of your influence, and teach them to value prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Every moment, live as in the consciousness of God's presence and pray. Dr. Yvonne prays, and I've been with her when her phone uh, timer goes off or the alarm, and it reminds her, it seems like it goes off at noon, Mr. Yeah. Danny, and it reminds her, pray. What a wonderful legacy of prayer. Number six, this is what I call the legacy of instruction. Weave the gospel into everyday life. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, the children of Israel were instructed to do this, but you and I are instructed to do this today. Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children to talk to them when you sit in the house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. Be consistent to weave the gospel. The word of God, the object lessons, bring to your children's mind and those within the sphere of your influence, God. Biblical truth should be as natural as breathing and extend that and teach that to those within the sphere of your influence. Finally, number seven is what I call the legacy of example. Practice what you preach. Live the gospel. Romans 2, this is a sad passage to me, Romans 2, 21 and 20 to 23. Paul's writing not to the Gentiles, not to the heathens. He's writing to the Jewish people. This is the people in church. And he says, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, yet you steal? Verse 23, you who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? Practice what you preach. Leave a legacy of example. Seven ways we can leave a spiritual legacy. 
is the legacy of stewardship. Recognize that God created and owns everything. The legacy of knowledge. Spend time in the word of God. The legacy of love. Love God and love other people. The legacy of faithfulness. Serve him faithfully with whatever God has put within your hands. The legacy of prayer. Pray, pray consistently. The legacy of instruction. Weave the gospel into everything in your life. And the legacy of example, practice what you preach. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah. Well, we have a few minutes or so give a closing thought, Danny. Well, do I'll give from Lanny Wolf wrote a song. Chorus says, only one life, soon it will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one chance to do his will. So give to Jesus all your days. It's the only life that pays when you recall you have but one life. Okay, mm -hmm. Shelley. Being financially faithful to God, he will bless you and keep stock of your affairs. Mm -hmm. From the devotional book, Faith uh, from the Heart, 157, it is the vision of the world to come that balances the mind so that the things which are seen do not obtain control over the affections which have been bought with an infinite price by the world's Redeemer. Amen. We all have an example. We all have an influence. We all have the opportunity to leave a legacy. Make sure your legacy counts. Wow, we've talked about giving back. And now as we close out this program, getting ready for number 11, which is managing in tough times, I want you to consider as you give, as you plan for your giving, think about ways, creative ways that you can advance the gospel even in your absence so that when the kingdom does roll, there will be people because of your liberality that will make the kingdom and God will bless you long after your voice is silenced. Here's a thought I want you to remember. Always give without remembering and always receive without forgetting. Thank you, Danny, Shelley, Johnny, and Jill. And thank you for taking the time to join us at 3ABN Sabbath School panel. Remember, you could download a copy of the lesson, but don't forget we have two more left and we look forward to seeing you next week for studying God's word as a family in the word. See you next time.